Okay. Okay. Can I have your attention, please? <clears throat> so, the main trick in this algorithm is uh, switching back and forth uh, between coefficient representation of a polynomial and value representation of a polynomial. And we want to do it in as clean ways as possible so that uh, it's clear to you how this is done and why it is doable in linear time. And again, the way to do that is to make your life more complicated by introducing matrix representation. Okay, so what are x zeros up to xn? They stand for some arbitrary numbers. It doesn't matter, maybe integers, maybe non-rational numbers, maybe complex numbers, we don't care about that at the moment. But the point is, if I give you values of your polynomial at any n plus one inputs, so in this case we are looking to multiply polynomials so the values of the inputs are positive integers, but who cares, we, once we start working with polynomials we might as well decide to evaluate them at negative numbers, even though that's not possible when we think of them as representing integers in the way we did. Simply the thing is, if the polynomial is of degree n, then any n plus one values at any distinct n plus one inputs uniquely de de determine your polynomial. So, how do you, if these are the coefficients of your polynomial, to find these values, all what you have to do is multiply this matrix with this vector. So here, what are x's? X's are some, any fixed n plus one many numbers whatsoever. Real, positive integers, or complex number, it doesn't matter. Why is this so? Well, look if I multiply matrix by the number, by this vector. I get one times a zero, this is just a zero, plus uh, a one times x zero, plus a two times x zero squared, all the way up to a n times x zero to the power n. So lo and behold, the first row times the vector gives you the value of your polynomial at x zero. And of course, the same applies um, for the other uh, altogether n plus one many uh, values. So notice, in our case, uh, x, if for example, when we split um, the, in three pieces, Right, we ended up with cubic polynomials, uh, sorry, with quadratic polynomials, and we needed five values. So x0 would be minus two, x1 will be minus one, uh, x2 will be uh, zero, x3 will be one, and x4 will be two. But this would be just a matrix of some values that are completely independent of the input integers. They are completely independent of these guys. Or these guys change as you change which numbers you are trying to multiply or which polynomials you are trying to multiply. But for as long as you keep number of slices equal to n plus one, or equivalently, the degree of your polynomial equals to n, this matrix won't change at all, right? Now we want to see, this is how you get from the coefficients the values of your polynomial. 
But how would you get the coefficients if you have the values of your polynomial? How would you get? Exactly. You simply multiply both sides by the inverse matrix, right? Uh, now, why is this matrix invertible? Well, it's an important matrix that has name. It's called uh, uh, Vandermond matrix, and one can show that for as long as uh, uh, all the inputs are distinct, this matrix is never singular, so you can invert it. In our case, right, when we found the values of the product, we simply multiply with this inverse matrix to get the coefficients of the product. So you can see these two formulas uh, allows you, allow you to commute between coefficient representation of a polynomial and value representation of the polynomial. Okay, so this is how you quickly commute between these two uh, forms of representation of polynomials. Okay, um, and in both cases, both forward transformation from the coefficients into the values will be in linear time because these will be all constants, right? This would be, as I say, minus two, uh, four, and so forth, right? And in the inverse matrix, again, this will be some constants. So lo and behold, going back and forth is doable in a linear time, right? So this is our strategy to multiply the polynomials fast. We will evaluate these two polynomials at 2n plus 1 many values. Why? Well, each polynomial is uniquely determined by n plus 1 values, but we are not just after this polynomial. We are after the product Pa of x times Pb of x. Both Pa of x and Pb of x are of degree n. Their product will be of degree 2n. So you need to evaluate your input, your polynomials at 2n plus 1 many values. Okay? So then what we do, then we find the values of the product polynomial at that values. How do we do that? Well, the product polynomial will, be, will have values that are values of the product of the individual values here of A and B, right? PA times PB of X evaluated at X0. That's precisely PA of X0 times PB at X0. So this will be the only expensive multiplications, right? Because you have no control how big P, uh, A of X, um, how big P, A of X and P, B of X are, right? Because you don't have control over the size of the coefficients of the polynomial. Then what you do, once you get these values you get the coefficients of your polynomial simply by uh, doing the inverse matrix business, right? You find C's by multiplying the inverse matrix with uh, the values, the vector of the values of the products. Now, what values should we choose for x0 up to x2n? Smallest possible by absolute value. Which are the 2n plus 1 smallest possible values? Minus n to n, right? So, lo and behold, we take these 2n plus 1 many inputs. Then we simply notice that multiplication by, an by a constant is in linear time 
because it's reducible to addition, one way to see it. Okay, so the upshot is that if I range with m between minus n and n, in linear time I can compute pa of m for all these inputs between minus n and n. Then what I can do is I can do the same for pb uh, of m, also in linear time, right? Now I perform 2n plus 1 multiplications of large numbers because I have no control how big these values are, right? Because they depend on the coefficients of the polynomial that can be arbitrarily large. Once I get these 2n plus 1 values, I know that these are the values of my product polynomial. So I simply, again, solve this system of linear equations, right? Because these are the values of the product polynomial. How do I get them? Lo and behold, in matrix form, this is what I have. And to get the vector of Cs, I simply multiply these with the inverse matrix. Now notice, n is a fixed parameter of the design, namely on how, how many slices I slice my numbers, or what is, or they are the coefficients of the polynomial that can be arbitrarily large, right? So, um, so only these values here, uh, n, n is fixed depends on how many, what, on the degree of the polynomials or on the how many slices you slice your numbers. But this is all filled with constants, right? So this multiplication is also doable in linear time. So here is now the whole algorithm, right? You simply slice the numbers, you, um, consider the two polynomials, you evaluate all um, both of polynomials between minus n and n, you multiply them pairwise, and then once you get these products, right, you call this PC of m, then you simply multiply with this inverse matrix to get Cs, Finally, you form back the polynomial and evaluate it at 2 to the k, which is trivial. It involves only shifting and adding. So how fast is our algorithm? Well, uh, first of all, when we compute the values, uh, what is the size of the values? Each slice a n can have at most it has a k many bits, so each a n is smaller than 2 to the k. m to the n is smaller than n to the n. So all of these guys, uh, all these powers are majorized by n to the n. Uh, and of course, I can pull them out and have the absolute values of the coefficients. Each of them is smaller than 2 to the k. So the whole value is smaller than n to the n times n times 2 to the k. Notice n is fixed. So this number contains at most k plus s many bits, where s is a fixed number that depends only on n. It doesn't depend on a's at all. So what did we accomplish? We reduced the multiplication of two k times n plus 1 digit numbers to 2n plus 1 multiplications of k plus s digit numbers plus the linear overhead that involved shifting and adding, right? So here is your recurrence. Uh, T of n plus 1 times k many bit numbers is reduced to 2n plus 1 multiplications of numbers that have k plus s many bits plus some constant times n for the overhead of shifting and adding. Now, 
we are not used to having kind of expression. Here we just want n, so we introduce a capital N that is equal to n plus one times k. So this becomes T of capital N. This is still 2n plus 1, which is a constant that depends uh, on the number of slices. Then this is n divided by n plus 1 plus s plus, uh, and I can replace k with n divided by n plus 1 right from here, and I get this expression. So now, again, we use uh, sloppiness, engineering sloppiness, S is a constant, it cannot change the growth rate of the recurrence, so we just ignore it. And instead, we solve um, the equation that is T of N equals 2N plus 1 times N over T, uh, N over N plus 1 uh, plus C over N plus 1 times N. It's important, this is just linear in capital N. And now we apply the master theorem. You see how useful master theorem is when it comes to divide and conquer uh, algorithms. A is here 2n plus 1, B is n plus 1, and this is linear in n. So the, we form the, this pivoting polynomial. Um, so what is then so this is, uh, so b is n plus 1, so log of the base is n plus 1, and uh, a is 2n plus 1. This is clearly bigger than 1. So you can, tr you can choose a small epsilon so that also log b of a is uh, um, minus epsilon is still bigger than 1, which means uh, that the overhead is dominated by this pivoting polynomial with slightly reduced overhead. And then, voila, master theorem first case applies, and you get that the solution is theta of n to the log b of a, which is n to the log n plus 1 of 2n plus 1. Now, how big is this? Lo and behold, this is smaller than n with basis uh, n plus 1 of 2n plus 2. I add 1 on top, right? And then I can break apart this product and get log n plus 1 of 2 plus log n plus 1 of log n plus 1, which is just 1. So I get this expression, n to the power 1 plus log n plus 1 of 2, which is equal to n on one, and then um, if you exchange the basis with the input of the logarithm, you get just the reciprocal, and this is what you get. Now notice if n increases, uh, this term goes to zero, right? So theoretically, if you choose sufficiently large n, your algorithm will run in time that is smaller than n to the power of 1 plus, say, 1.00001. But is this of any use? So let's see, in order to, say, uh, uh, have an algorithm that will run in time n to the power of 1.1, you have to choose this reciprocal to be 1 tenth, right? And if you solve this, you get that log 2 of n plus 1 is 10. And uh, you get that uh, n plus 1 has to be equal to 2 to the 10. So lo and behold, uh, n should be approximately equal to 2 to the 10. So to get to the power n to the power 1.1, you would have to slice in 1,024 pieces. But then what happens when you evaluate these two polynomials, PA of X and PBX, from minus N to N, right? You have this expression, but N is equal approximately 2 to the 10. It's 2 to the 10 minus 1, right? So N to the N is this number. 
So this a little constant uh, turn out to be just absolutely humongous. So the moral of the story is theoretically you can in fact get as close as you want to the linear time but with constants that explode. So Practically, this renders the algorithm useless whenever n is bigger probably than five or six pieces. So this is an extremely good example why you should be careful with asymptotic estimates. Asymptotic estimates are useless unless you have control, you know approximately how big are the constants involved so that the bound is not rendered useless due to the size of the constants. Yes? What's the optimal number of the number of threads? Okay, the optimal number of slices is don't use this algorithm at all. <laughs> because uh, there are much faster algorithms, right? In, uh, in early days, in fact, fast integer multiplication was done with Karatsuba uh, with the three or five slices, but uh, after that, because of the advent of cryptography, people have designed uh, much faster algorithms. The fastest running in time n times log n times log log n. Now, n times log n grows much slower than n to the power 1.1, .1, even 1.01. As soon as the exponent is even slightly larger than 1, this bound becomes much larger than n log n. So now, that's first moral, right? We have to make sure we keep track of the size of the constant. But now let us see what got us in trouble. What got us in trouble is uh, that uh, um, is evaluation of polynomials in powers of the inputs. So we need inputs that do not grow fast when you take them to large powers. But as long as the input is bigger than one, it will grow fast. So what should we take? How about we take an input smaller than one? What will be the problem? They become just vanishingly small. Go way below the uh, machine uh, uh, floating point representation. So what we need are numbers that no matter to what power you take them, they remain of the same size. Are there such numbers? One is, but it's only one and we need many of them. Complex numbers. So voila, in order to carry on with this trick of switching between coefficient representation and value representation without having the explosion of size, we are brought to introduce complex number and evaluating polynomials at these complex numbers is nothing but what is called FFT or fast Fourier Transform. So you see, we naturally were led to introduce fast Fourier transform. Let us quickly see. Um, let us quickly see uh, why this is good. Um, I know that uh, you are having an overload, but. Uh, uh, Bear with me just a few more minutes and then we will, um, we will finish a little bit early so that you 
cool down your heads, but uh, let me just quickly show you what the idea is. Uh, Okay, uh, just what is, let me just, we will go through this. What are complex numbers? Uh, complex numbers, as you know well, have imaginary and real part. That's one way of seeing them. The other way is by their modulus and argument, which is just this angle with the positive x-axis. Uh, now, if you take Primitive, if you take roots of unity, you see, what are roots of unity? They are solutions to the equation z to the n equals to 1. It turns out, as we will see next time, that these solutions are simply equally spaced point on the unit circle in the complex plane. And if you take them to any power, how do we take a complex number in polar form to any power? You take its modulus to that power, but if the modulus is one, if they all sit on the unit circle, what happens to the modulus when you take it to n power? Stays on the circle. What happens with the arguments? When you square a complex number, you double its argument. When you cube it, you triple its argument. And as you will see next time, when you take any of these equally spaced points to any integer power, it, they will just keep spinning around the circle and hitting exactly the same points. So voila, this is why they are useful for fast polynomial multiplication, you can take them to any power and not have expansion of the size. But it gets even better. Complex, the roots of unity have a very beautiful property that is called cancellation property, which you will see next time, that will allow us to do one-shot multiplication in time n log n, right? Uh, because the conversion will be from uh, um, coefficient form into the value form in linear time, sorry, in time n log n. Multiplication will be in linear time and going back will be also n log n and it will be done using a divide and conquer procedure that is lightening uh, fast. So I think you got enough for today. Let's stop here a little bit early. Please read this at home. My goodness, I didn't know I'm so...